My pleasure to introduce this afternoon's uh, physics colloquium speaker, who is Matthew Elford, who comes for us, comes to us from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. Matthew did his BA degree in Swarthmore College in 1993 and finished his PhD at Scripps in 1998, following which he spent uh, the better part of 15 or 16 years uh, at the Applied Physics Laboratory of the University of Washington. Uh, he was then called back to home to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where he's now full professor of physical oceanographer, I mean, he's a, a, a seagoing physical oceanographer, which means that he actually knows a great deal about the ocean, having experienced both its ups and downs. I mean, we're all familiar with ocean waves on the surface of the, of the sea and watching them break to make turbulence. We're a lot less knowledgeable what goes on in the interior volume of the ocean. Uh, and Matthew is really a world expert in understanding the turbulence and the waves which exist in the interior of the sea and which are playing such a huge role in our understanding of the contribution of the oceans to global climate change. So his talk today uh, is, in, is entitled, Measuring the Internal Waves and Turbulence in the Oceans, uh, How and Why. So please, Matthew. Thanks, Dick, for that nice introduction, and just thanks for uh, having me here. Um, anybody who knows anybody in the admissions office, um, one of the reasons I'm here is that my daughter is a senior in high school, and she's applied to come to the University of Toronto. We just took a campus tour, <laughs> and she hopes she gets in. She loves it. Um, so this talk is really going to be a bit of a wild ride. I'm totally aware that we have a very broad physics audience here. I'm really going to be talking about some fundamental fluid mechanics. Uh, but really, I am also going to take this opportunity to sort of just, just show you, give you a little glimpse about what the actual interior of the, of the ocean is like uh, from an observational perspective. And so one of the ways I kind of like to get started is wherever I give this talk, I try to put, you know, whatever the tallest building. It turns out Toronto has a really friggin' tall building. Um, so it's not quite as impressive. Um, so what this is... Uh, but the, but the point is that these, these the, the, of course, the, the, the interior of the ocean is, is density stratified. It gets colder and generally saltier as you go down. So that's a stable stratification. It was, you know, for centuries or de decades really thought to be more or less a boring swamp. And what we've been learning in the last 50 or 60 years, let me just quickly explain this photograph here, or this, uh, this image here. So this is about three hours of data from a really dense thermistor chain that we put in about 1800 meters of water. So over a mile down or uh, 1.8 kilometers, right? I'm not in the silly old US. Um, and then each of these little vertical dashed lines here is, uh, is a thermistor sampling just the temperature at, at one Hertz. So very, very fast. And so you have the usual kind of warm water up here. You can see there's about a 0.3 Kelvin temperature range here with cold water at the bottom. But what's happened here is one of these massive uh, several hundred meters high breakers uh, has, has actually swept uh, cold water above warm water. And so this is an incredibly turbulent, very unstable situation that's taller than a lot of skyscrapers, although not yours. Um, the physics of this are actually very, very similar to convective instability, which uh, I happen to be a surfer. And uh, we like to be in this situation where we have dense fluid above light fluid. That's called the barrel. And uh, we like to spend as much time in there as possible. And so what I'll be talking to you a little bit today is really three, three things. One is just, first of all, trying to make the case that aside from this gee whiz of these big breakers in the deep sea, what do they actually matter? And I'll, I'll sort of explain that they, they matter for several things. Uh, most notably, uh, our ability to, to accurately simulate the climate. Um, and then there's a little bit of a technological story here too. I'll tell you a little bit about my research group and how our kind of mission is to take uh, these decades old techniques for measuring turbulence in the deep sea, which used to involve hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of instrumentation and big teams of seagoing engineers. And this is something called an Argo float, what we've done now is these are now, we've really miniaturized this, taking a lot of advances from uh, mobile electronics. And so now this can be done for sort of $1,000 instead of 
$300,000. And it's so small and low power that you can now put these on these autonomous platforms. And again, since this isn't an oceanographic audience, the ocean is full of about 3,800 of these. This is called the Argo Array. And every 10 days, these, uh, these, these autonomous vehicles go up and down from the surface to 2,000 meters measuring temperature and salinity. And so one of my sort of evil dreams is that someday each of these floats will be actually directly measuring turbulence as well. And then this finally is this, a system that we'll be talking about towards the end of the talk that's uh, more a shipboard system. Uh, this is a very e economical system. This is more of a custom high-tech system for really, really making these deep, these deep measurements. And this, this talk is really de uh, dedicated to two huge, huge, huge mentors in my life. Walter, Walter Bunk, of course, everybody's heard of Walter. Uh, he died at the age of 102 in 2019. He was actually a dear friend of mine. And uh, that's actually Freeman Dyson, another famous physicist sitting with him. Um, and I snapped that photo. Um, actually, my wife snapped that photo. And then, um, and then Mike Gregg was my postdoc advisor at, uh, at UW. And he, he really, Mike, so, so Walter actually came up with a lot of the sort of theories that we'll be talking about, about which there's a paradox, a, a seeming paradox that we're hoping to resolve. And then Mike actually uh, designed some of these early pioneering microstructure systems. Okay. So let's try to at least, uh, you know, turbulence in the ocean is a hundred year topic. It's gonna be hard to, to, to spin everybody up on this uh, in a 45 minute talk. But essentially, if we think about uh, this quantity B, we call the buoyancy, let's just think of that as temperature. If we think about the material or the total derivative of buoyancy, it really is only, so, so what I'm saying is a, as a fluid parcel, its temperature can only change due to the divergence of the turbulent buoyancy flux, which we can think of in kind of a Reynolds averaging sense. I'll show you a slide in a moment, which will sort of make that a little more clear, but we often parameterize this in sort of a fixed law sort of a way where we say, okay, well, the turbulent buoyancy flux would be then a diffusivity times a background gradient of buoyancy. Now this is completely justifiable if this is the molecular diffusivity and these are actual background gradients of temperature, then that's just heat conduction. And what we're doing here is we're saying this is the turbulent analog. So then this is no longer a property of the fluid, but it's rather a property of the flow. And it, it's, it varies by orders of magnitude in the ocean. And it turns out is actually rather crucial to the oceans setting its thermal structure. So one of the things that causes turbulence in the ocean is those breaking internal waves that I showed you the photo of. And this is a little bit what they look like. This is a numerical simulation. And as it says here, my sort of observational goal is to, is to someday come up with an observational version of this that's, that's as lovely as this, as this simulation. What Craig Winters did in this is he, he had an internal wave coming from the right, shoaling on an underwater sloping boundary. And then he actually put dye in the simulation. This is not a direct numerical simulation. He's got a hyper viscosity in here. But what you can see is just the complexity of these breaking motions. And as kind of a hint to what one of the points I'll be making in this talk is, you can see it's a very three-dimensional process, highly complex and, uh, and resisting characterization by, by simple 1D models. By the way, I wanted to really invite all of you guys, if I say jargony things that don't make any sense because this is a broad audience, please just interrupt me and, uh, and ask any questions that, that make sense. So my research group, we call ourselves MOD, the Multi-Scale Ocean Dynamics Group. There's about 40 of us. Um, and the, 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 the most wonderful thing about MOD is these, is these 12 engineers. Um, these really are incredibly talented people who are serving a combination of um, the sort of wacky science ideas of these six principal investigators. And so we have a lot of students and postdocs. Uh, basically our mission is to, is to go to sea but not just to go to sea with the same old instrumentation. We're really always trying to, to invent new ways of observing the ocean. And I'll show you a couple of those in this talk. We have a lot of fun when we go to sea. Um, I'll show you some at sea photos, but you know, at times there, is, uh, there are handstands on icebergs involved. There are students uh, having a good time in front of icebreakers. There are research vessels in Santorini. It's nice to be an observational oceanographer sometimes. There's other times it's not so nice, but generally it's nice to be an observational oceanographer. 
I like to show this sort of, what does the ocean actually look like from a numerical model simulation? Um, some of the people I believe are actually using this simulation. This is Dimitri Menemenlis's kind of wonderful two kilometer simulation of the ocean. And what I'm plotting here is, uh, is just the speed of the surface currents, right? And so you kind of get a sense of the overall just range of scales spanned by the ocean. And this is, this is kind of our, it's almost like a truism in oceanography that in order to really understand these mesoscale eddies and these, gen these general circulations, you know, here's, here's the Gulf Stream, here's the Kuroshio, these are just transporting massive amounts of heat around and dissipating massive amounts of energy. Um, all of that is actually made possible by, uh, by motions at the very, very smallest scales. And so I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that. But uh, it's, it's important to keep this in mind, just how challenging this idea of actually understanding the energetics of the ocean is. Internal waves, let's just do a little bit more of a dive into internal waves. This is actually a photo that was snapped from the roof of my building um, at Scripps, that's a Scripps pier. And you see these, these surface slick here and you wonder what they are. It's actually, they're actually not surface waves. It turns out they're actually the surface convergence of internal gravity waves. So this sort of schematic here is kind of what I mean by that. If you imagine sort of having a light layer of fluid here at the top and then a, de a, a more dense layer down here, when an internal wave comes along, it depresses that interface. If you, again, if you idealize it as a two layer fluid, a real ocean is continuously stratified. But what happens is at the front edge of that wave, you have a convergence and you have a divergence at the trailing edge. And so whenever you, so, so that actually turns out it, that whatever's on the surface, whether it's uh, kelp oil in the previous photo or even breaking surface waves gets focused there. And so you get these, these, these fronts and these slicks that propagate along. And if you're in a place like the South China Sea, where the internal waves really are supersized, the biology has learned to actually take advantage of this. So what I mean by that is that these are tidally generated in the South China Sea. And every tidal period, you will see like clockwork, a pod of pilot whales foraging in the wake of these waves because they know that it's bringing up, uh, it's upwelling and bringing nutrients from the deep. Oh, and then the last thing is, this is another example. This is another similar sort of more thermistor record of a much smaller wave in off the Washington coast where I used to hang out. And what happens on the trailing edge then is there's a, there's a huge amount of shear that develops on the back end of that wave. And it leads to Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities that lead to turbulence. So these are one way that uh, internal waves can break. So the problem I'll be talking about today is again, this is an old problem. This was when Walter was probably only mid-career. Um, so that what I'm talking about is a 1966 paper by Walter Monk called Abyssal Recipes. And what he said is, if you look at a cross section of the, of the global ocean, we know that because uh, the polar regions have so much of a heat loss from the ocean to the atmosphere, you'll get a tremendous amount of cooling and densification of the water up there. And it sinks straight to the bottom. That's called deep water formation. And it turns out that happens at about 30 sverdrups, which is 30 million cubic meters per second. So that's the amount of water that's flowing down to the seafloor in lower latitudes. And then for steady state, well, you can actually think for a second about what would happen in an ocean where there were very little turbulence in the deep sea. What would eventually happen is the whole water would simply fill up with that very, very cold, unstratified water from the poles. That's called a filling box. And then you'd have a very thin thermal boundary layer at the top, but basically no stratification in the interior. That's definitely not what we see in the ocean. And so Walter was able to do a simple scaling analysis again, using the same equation, where we said, okay, if this is an actual observed profile of the temperature of the ocean, then this turns out to be the dominant balance in this equation I showed you a second ago. Specifically, we have, we need an upwelling velocity balancing downward turbulent diffusion of heat because it's enabled because of the, the curvature of the, of the temperature profile. So basically, as you fill up the deep sea with cold water, 
you can think of it as turbulence is required to raise the potential energy of that system for a steady state. It turns, it turns out there's actually a really interesting catch to that. If you notice, we did in this equation, we took K out of this uh, operator here, which means we're assuming it's constant. Okay, so that's actually gonna turn out to be important because what we've assumed in this balance is a depth constant diffusivity. So now moving forward to um, basically this spawned a tremendous amount of development of the ability to measure turbulence in the ocean. Cause we said, okay, we know what the bulk value of that diffusivity is we need for a balance. Can we go actually measure that? And people went out and they tried to measure it and they didn't find it. So they said, okay, what's the, we have these ideas called deep dark mixing and things like that. But essentially a lot of people went out to regions like this where the diffusivity is very small. And then this paper by Kurt Polzin and co-authors turned out to be a really seminal paper where we discovered, so this is a section now across the, North, across the South Atlantic. And what you see is that there's very, very weak turbulence in the ocean when you're over smooth topography. But then when you, and topography, you know, means the bottom of the ocean, um, the seafloor topography. And then you, and then you start getting over these ridge, these ridge and canyon systems, and all of a sudden you have very, very strong turbulence, but not just in a frictional boundary layer, right? This is this is hundreds and hundreds of meters above the seafloor, which suggests that there's a wave generation process where the waves are then radiating up into the ocean. Now, the important part of this, um, this was. This was actually quite significant because the, the, the debate in those days is, can we find enough turbulence? And we sort of went out and, and I think there's enough turbulence in the ocean, but now the, the interesting debate is that if we go back to that equation, it turns out if, if the buoyancy flux is enhanced towards the seafloor, and that makes sense because it's, it's due to bottom generated processes, well, then the divergence of the buoyancy flux has the wrong sign and you can't get upwelling, so you can't get a steady state. So Raf Ferrari and others have been actually saying that this is a paradox, and it is a paradox if you insist on a 1D balance, okay? The last point I'll make here, which is again, kind of part of my evil vision for getting turbulence on all these Argo floats, is that this, after all these years, is all of the full depth microstructure measurements that have ever been made in the entire ocean. So you shouldn't be very impressed by this figure. Okay, so climate, um, you know, turbulence in the ocean, as I sort of hinted on that slide, but didn't say, there's a lot of real practical reasons why you'd like to know the instantaneous and in situ turbulence where you are, such as if you're trying to sequester CO2, or you're trying to mine the deep sea, and you want to know how your, your, your plume that you generated is going to spread. But I think the most sort of existential threat is, is actually climate change. And so this is just a very simple graphic that we've probably all seen before. And it's actually a little bit outdated at this point. Um, but we now know from the Argo records and from the satellite records, the rate of sea level rise here. And then basically we take all the climate models that exist and run them into the future to 2100. And, and this, is a this is actually a pretty big spread, right? I mean, these are incredibly complicated models, but this is a big spread. And we actually just recently completed what's something called a climate processes team, where we observational oceanographers like me teamed up with the people who are actually running these climate models. And there, are, there were other ones on cloud microphysics and ice sheets and things like that. But this one was really all about how much does parameterizations of internal wave driven mixing affect climate models. And the arrow is just as big as these other things that really plague climate modelers such as cloud microphysics. So the point is this work is actually really important for our ability to improve climate simulations. Okay, I apologize in advance for this very detailed slide. This is everything you need to know about microstructure in one slide. Okay, first of all, how do we actually measure turbulence in the ocean? So we typically do it, I showed you a couple of photos at the beginning. We basically do it with phonograph needles, record player needles, or they're also called piezoelectric bimorph beams. So essentially you have a platform that's going down through the ocean as smoothly as possible. And if there's a turbulent velocity, the beam gets deflected, it makes a voltage and we measure it. We also measure what's called the 
basically the, the, the very, very small scale temperature variance. Okay. So those two things, one is called epsilon. And this is a very complicated plot here, but essentially we do it by measuring the small scale shear from those shear probes, those uh, airfoil probes or the bimorpheme probes. And they have some noise at certain scales. And so it's a bit of a, it's actually quite complicated to extract epsilon from those records, but it is very, very, very tried and true technique. So from the shear probes, we can get epsilon. That's the, the rate at which turbulent kinetic energy is being dissipated in the ocean. And there are some assumptions that go into that, such as you're only measuring one component of shear, et cetera, but we think it's pretty good. And then the second piece of that is this thing called the buoyancy flux, which appeared in those other equations. So what this is, is the actual turbulent kinetic energy equation where I've thrown out all of the terms that I don't think are important. And so you'll see this in Penicus and Ludley, Lundley and other turbulence textbooks. This, this basically says that production arises when I have a background shear. That's a source of energy for the turbulence. Epsilon is always a sink because it's actually the rate at which you know, uh, viscosity is, is working on the turbulent motions. And then this thing, the buoyancy flux arises when you have a stratified fluid and it can actually have either sign. And this is kind of what gives us all heartburn in ocean turbulence right now is because this is the quantity we really wanna know, but we actually mostly can't measure it. And so we have to measure epsilon. So we can estimate it two ways. The first model is this paper by uh, Tom Osborne in 1980, where we can actually say there's, there's, there's reasons to think that actually the buoyancy flux and epsilon are linearly proportional to each other and, and, and through this constant called gamma, which is the mixing efficiency. So what that says is, um, is if I have a certain, if I have a watt of, of, of power that's going into the dissipation, I will get 0.2 watts of actual increase of potential energy of the system due to mixing. And then I can estimate it another way from the rate of temperature variance. So for this talk, the point is that, um, it's gonna become clear in a minute why we care so much about the buoyancy flux, but uh, we usually estimate it with epsilon, but we can actually, if we have epsilon and this thermal dissipation rate, we can actually directly estimate this mixing efficiency. And we do all this with microstructure profilers. So the way this, this, this paradox works, as I sort of hinted here, is that if, if in a 1D model, where you have the buoyancy flux increasing towards the seafloor, you would expect uh, the divergence of the buoyancy flux to be consistent with downwelling. That's very bad if you want a steady state system. However, we can sort of think that very, very close to the seafloor, there must be zero buoyancy flux because you can't have heat exchange between the ocean and the boundary unless there's a geothermal heat flux. And so over some scale, this must go to zero. And so, and the only way to make that happen in this 1D model is to have the mixing efficiency change. Okay, so that's why I'm kind of hyper focused on this. And this is essentially the paradox we're trying to resolve with this field campaign I'll be showing you about. Just to sort of sketch that a little bit more, the idea here is that if I have a profile of epsilon, which is what we measured, and it goes towards the seafloor, then what we're sort of thinking must happen in this 1D model is that the buoyancy flux must somehow go to zero. And the only way to, for that to happen in this, in this paradigm is for the mixing efficiency to decrease from its interior value towards zero. And then just an aside is that actually, uh, yeah, Dick's student, Ali, has written several papers on this uh, showing that actually the relationship between uh, the mixing and the dissipation rate, this gamma, is actually really also important for climate simulations. So there's other reasons to where you'd like to know about it. Okay, I feel like I need to speed up a little bit. This is the old way we used to measure turbulence. This is actually Mike Gregg's microstructure profiler. Again, this is an incredible piece of engineering here, about $300,000. You got the shear airfoil probes here. You'll typically have the thermistors measuring temperature here, and then we try to also measure uh, the small scale currents in front acoustically. So what I discovered as a postdoc, uh, you know, and anybody who does microstructure in the ocean kind of has to 
has to learn this whole cottage industry. This is, this is actually quite complicated stuff. So putting these on autonomous platforms is actually non-trivial. But it's, it's actually a really good idea to do because it used to be really hard and expensive. And I learned, because I was Mike's postdoc, and this happened when I was the chief scientist on the ship, that it's really, really sad when you break a $300,000 instrument. So um, now we, we build, we're building instruments for sort of, you know, two orders of magnitude less expensive than that. And we can have, we can, I'll show you, we can, we can be a lot more creative. We can be a lot more risk, uh, non-risk averse, et cetera. Okay, so this is the whole idea here is that we've really, really miniaturized this entire system. And now we can start putting it on all kinds of autonomous platforms. And just, again, for those in the room who don't know about the Argo program, this is the coverage of the Argo program versus the direct measurements here. So it's possible to indirectly measure turbulence from the Argo program. And the idea is that by doing this, we'd have direct measurements everywhere. Okay, so I think I've said enough about the technology. So what, what I'll be talking about now is this, this effort that actually was led by Raf Ferrari. Again, this is this paper called Upside Down Mixing, written in 2016. And it's, it's really intended to resolve this so-called paradox where how do we actually get upwelling when turbulence is increasing towards the seafloor, okay? So this is this, if you ever have a chance to go on a research vessel, do. But if you ever have a chance to choose between a US research vessel and a, and a, and a British research vessel, go with the Brits. This is the discovery. It's just a floating palace. So what we tried to do in this experiment is we really, so we wanted to measure, is there upwelling near the seafloor? And can we actually understand it given the structure of turbulence that we can observe? So we did a few novel things in this experiment. And the, the thing that I'm really excited about is we actually just, just put dye down there. So we actually squirted a bunch of, it turned out not to be pink, it was green. So we actually dyed the bottom boundary layer of the ocean green. And I'll show you those, those measurements. And they really do show unequivocally that there, is, that there was upwelling. And then the next trick is, can we measure the turbulence close enough to the seafloor where we can reject or accept some of these one-dimensional model theories? And so to do that, we actually had to, had to modify our turbulence profiler. Most turbulence profilers just fall very slowly through the ocean with kind of a parachute um, or called drag screens the entire way. Well, this, this experiment was in about 2,000 meters of water, and we didn't have time to wait for our profiler to go that slow. So we built a skydiving profiler by actually clamping its arms down to its side, and then so it would fall like a stone, and then we would tell it to open its drag screens, and it would get turbulence profilers for the bottom part of the water column. So the place we were working is called the Rockall Trough. It's uh, just off of Ireland. And... Um, and, and, and we chose it to be a, a submarine canyon. Mostly the reason we did that is because submarine canyons are known to have very strong internal tides and internal waves. So there's lots of turbulence signal. But the other nice thing is that normally when you do dye experiments in the ocean, the, the alongshore currents quickly sweep the dye away and it becomes really, really hard to find it again. Whereas if you're in a canyon, it's topographically constrained to be near you. So these are some of our tools. So the first thing, this is a, so, so we, we, the first thing we have, and I think this was actually the sort of the title slide that was in the elevator. We have this wonderful uh, direct drive electric winch that we use to, to move our instruments up and down from the ship very fast. And it's on this huge long boom that keeps it away from the ship where the instruments can be chomped up like the photo you saw before. So this is called the fast CTD and it's a, one of our turbulence profilers. We have a fluorometer on there that allows us to measure the dye in situ. So we can make these really highly resolved measurements of the dye. We also had something called a Mort profiler that we put in the water that, to also measure the dye and the turbulence. And so basically it's crawling up and down this wire here with a fluorometer as well and a turbulence instrument, this, this epsilometer that we built. Um, and so that's also detecting the dye. And, and we'll show you how that actually um, helps us interpret the dye patterns. So here's this, uh, this the chute you can see, it starts out falling very fast with the arms at its sides, and then it, the, 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 the parachute opens and it falls very slowly. So we had to get that tested out and working before we did that. 
And then here's the die. This is a very uh, high-tech oceanographic system called an oil drum. And uh, what we did is we lowered it to the bottom of the sea, and then we had an acoustically tripped uh, lid opener, basically, that, uh, that, that released the dye. So, so we put a lot of dye in the water. It's about 200 gallons of, uh, of diluted, diluted dye. And if you get this on the deck, it really does make this, the ship green. Okay, so this is the sort of, um, in some ways, this is the bottom line up front for what I'll show you. And then that way I can make sure that if I get rushed towards the end, you can go home with the main message. So we really did find kind of a mini world ocean in this, in this canyon. And what I mean by that is, again, you remember that sort of side view of the, the world oceans that I showed you, where you have deep water formation at the poles. So we really did measure, th there's a large scale pressure gradient in the system that's actually causing an up canyon flow. And so that's sort of superimposed on the system. And again, with the filling box argument, if that were persisting without turbulence, this isotherm would in time move up, right? And so for a steady state, there has to be, there has to be a, a, a flux of, of, uh, of, of mass basically through these isotherms in order to keep. So we can think of that as if this isotherm is gonna stay put, then there must be actual mass transport through that isotherm to match this flow down here at this side. So this we're measuring with uh, just conventional current, current, current meters. This is about two centimeters per second of up canyon flow. The dye got released here. And what I'm actually plotting is basically just anywhere we saw dye, this is not a very scientific plot, but, th but this is just to sort of show you what actually happened. So you can see the dye started here and it really did creep its way up towards warmer water. And so that really was, and we can get much more quantitative with that. And that really does show us that there is this mass transport through these, these isopycnals, which has to happen due to turbulence. Except, and then I'll show you this, the data from all these um, different stations that we did. So each of these little insets here are log scale profiles of the buoyancy flux. And this is just a subset of them. So you can actually see that most of them do in fact increase towards the seafloor. Um, and that, that's consistent with downwelling, right? That's not consistent with upwelling. So there's, there's kind of a bit of a paradox in this, in this figure that it'll be sort of my job to explain, although we're still in the middle of understanding how this actually all works. Okay, so a little bit about how we sample dye. You know, dye, the ocean is just, it's just so fast and the scales are so hard. Even if you have a really capable research vessel and an incredible instrument like this dye sampler that we, that we have, it's still really easy to get uh, outraced. And so what we, what we did is we did as many times as we could, we would just simply do these, these, uh, these crosses uh, through the canyon. And so you'll see that there's some interesting sampling issues that come up um, and, and it's, just, it's just the usual Doppler shifting thing. So if, 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 if there's a tide going this way, pushing this dye cloud up this way, and I'm sampling it with the ship in this direction, it's gonna appear compressed. And of course, if I'm following it down the canyon, it's gonna appear much uh, longer. And so we had to sort all those scales out. So these are some just examples of the raw data of us sampling the dye. So this is only two hours after we put the dye in the water. And you can see that the internal tide uh, convergence in the bottom boundary layer very quickly took all the dye and just really shoved it into this, this incredibly uh, vertically convergent sort of stack. And then, uh, and then the next time we saw it was just two hours later, it was actually on its way down. And so part of the reason why it appears so much longer is this sampling effect that I was telling you about, but it's also the effect of the internal tide squishing and squeezing um, that, that has it do that. And so, the last aspect of the dye that's qualitative, but super, super, super key to this entire story is remember, actually, I, I should have pointed it out on the schematic. So here's, here's where this Mord profiler is with the, with the fluorometer here. 
And so what I'll show you is the data that, that shows you that the dye was actually injected into the interior, right? So if you remember that movie I showed at the very beginning that had this really vigor vigorous uh, exchange of fluid between the boundary and the interior, this is really consistent with that. And it's very, very inconsistent with a one-dimensional model. So now returning to the actual dye data from the mooring, you can now see this is now uh, 60 hours. So it's just two and a half days. And then uh, we're plotting since the release of the dye cloud. And so for, for a whole day, we saw nothing in terms of dye. This is the up canyon, down canyon velocity. So you can see the, the internal tide is just sloshing up and down the canyon, moving the isotherms up and down quite vigorously. And then twice, we actually saw the, the, the dye get sort of blown past this board profiler, which is, which, is a, which is a real clear demonstration of this exchange of fluid with the boundary in the interior. Oceanographers love to look at temperature salinity profiles. And so, uh, by the way, this is all work, all this dye work is by my student, uh, Bethan Wynn Katanat, um, who's done a really, really wonderful job of this analysis. So what she's done is she's actually used the method of Holmes and Ruan and uh, Ferrari to compute the dye-weighted uh, dye temperature and dye-weighted salinity. So what this means is that if you're plotting temperature here and salinity here, this was the conditions at the release of the actual dye cloud that we put in in the first place. And then what you can see is this slow marching of the dye towards warmer temperatures, lighter water, which really quantifies the rate at which it's, it's warming. And if you turn all of that into uh, upwelling rates, it actually is very, very close to the right number that you would need to balance that two centimeters a second we measured at the morning. So this all seems to kind of hold together. Now, the final question that we'll ask ourselves is can we actually make any sense of the actual highly detailed turbulence measurements that we made in order to actually explain any of this? So the dye tells us what actually happened, but it doesn't tell us anything about the processes. And so what we hope we can do with these, these turbulence measurements is actually understand what's really going on. Okay. So what these are is again, returning to our schematic. And these are just the time series of directly measured turbulence. So these are actually a pretty big achievement here. Uh, and we've got now 12 of these because this, this figure was made after only the first cruise. So we've got 12 of these stations. And so what we basically do is we would sit at one of these locations with the ship. You know, we would do our parachute popping thing to get the, the instrument down here. And then we would just basically yo-yo the instrument up and down. It's hard to read these labels, but in all cases, this is about 400 meters off the bottom. And so you say, hey, Alfred, you said you were sitting at one location. Why is the bottom coming up and then going down? Well, that's actually the ship is staying put, but the currents are sweeping the instrument up, the, up canyon and down canyon as it goes. And that's actually a really, really nice quality. It's a bad quality if you want to study the exact same part near the same spot on the seafloor. But it turns out if you're following the flow, that's actually a really, really good reference frame to be in because you can neglect a lot more of the lateral terms in these, uh, these microstructure balances. So I'll show one of these figures in a little more detail and, uh, and what I think is going on. So this is just one of them. This is 12 hours of data. And what I've done is I've actually shifted to uh, a coordinate system where it's now just plotting height above bottom. So again, you know, the, the whole key of this experiment is really getting sort of two to five meters above the bottom. And you can see this is, this is towards the beginning of the very first cruise. We were being a little conservative. We're starting out 20 meters above the bottom or so here. And you can see it started to creep down. And typically, you know, when we're at sea, we have different watch standards. Usually when I'm out on deck, I'm a little braver, and so these will be me. Um, sometimes we hit the bottom, in which case we have this crash guard to protect the probes. But by the end of the second cruise, we were really targeting basically two to five meters off the bottom and getting there almost every time. And that's, that's amazing in 2,000 meters of water. So the other part of this that's actually really, really cool is that um, 
typically microstructure profilers, as I said, they, they do have to go slow. So this is falling down through the water at about a half a meter per second. And that takes some time, but because we're not waiting to come all the way back up to the surface, we're saving so much time. And so a lot of microstructure is done statistically, but what we love about these data is that they actually are really resolving the processes that are breaking in the ocean, okay? So each of these vertical strips is a profile of epsilon, which is this, it's log epsilon, it's this kinetic energy, turbulent kinetic energy dissipation rate. And then you're also seeing the black lines are the isotherms. And each vertical column is one profile and they do them about every 13 minutes or so. So, um, so we're pretty resolved. Um, although again, with the ocean just being kind of fractal and very, very hard to observe, this is a pretty big achievement to get 13 minute profiles. But remember, go all the way back to that image that I showed you from the beginning that was one second resolution. We're still missing, we're still missing variants in the ocean. So the ocean really is, uh, is, 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 is multi-scale. But what I see in these data is that this is happening during a period when the tidal flow was up canyon. And so there's this old cartoon, but it's a sheared, it's a sheared flow. And so there's this old cartoon from lakes where if you have a frictional boundary layer creating some shear, then you will eventually sweep cold water above denser water and you'll get a convective instability there. So this has been observed before in lakes, but this vertical scale here would be sort of that of a frictional boundary layer of a meter or two, or maybe even less. Here you can see now that, and I, I'm not showing this to back this up in this plot, but we can, we can show that it is this same mechanism that's causing convective instability during this part of the water column, but it's 250 meters high, right? So these are incredibly vigorous internal tide shears that are creating these instabilities and leading to turbulence. And then later in the tidal cycle, you have these other layers over here, which look a lot more like shear instability to us. So a kind of a standard Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Okay. So it's really nice to have resolved data so you can start looking at processes. But what I'll finish with is this slide here that I, I'm really just working on this right now. So I apologize, it's not as annotated. So I'll walk you through it. One of the things I really wanna be able to do in this is again, if you think about the 1D model, crucial for upwelling is that that buoyancy flux has got to decrease to zero. So the first, and so, so we, and that can happen several different ways, but one way it can happen is if this mixing efficiency drops from 0 0.2 to lower than 0 0.2, like zero. So there's going all the way back to that very busy slide. There's two ways that we can estimate buoyancy flux. One is by simply is from epsilon and that's here. Now I'm plotting versus temperature not uh, height above the bottom. So this is epsilon times uh, a, a mixing efficiency. And then this is another one that's more direct from the thermal rate of variance uh, loss. And that should give us, so those two estimates together should give us uh, buoyancy flux. And what you would expect if the mixing efficiency decreases dramatically approaching the seafloor, is that these two estimates would diverge from one another. So that is the, the red line, you would expect it to start dropping below the blue line. And that's made more quantitative here because this is simply the ratio of those two, which is the mixing efficiency. And so what this all says is that we don't see any reduction in mixing efficiency at all. And in fact, remember the whole point here is that buoyancy flux has to decrease towards the seafloor if we're gonna see upwelling. We don't see that either. If anything, actually, we see a buoyancy, a, a mixing efficiency increase towards the seafloor, which we're getting a little shaky theoretical grounds here, but that might be consistent with these convective processes. So I'll leave it there because this really is uh, work that's ongoing uh, and just conclude. So I've shown you some uh, pictures, some pretty pictures of the ocean that, it's, uh, that show just the, the wide range of, of, of what the ocean actually looks like when you observe it uh, observationally, and then made the case that we need to understand these processes better for climate. And 
And I personally feel like this really is an exciting time for ocean turbulence measurements simply because there is so much new work by the likes of uh, Dick's old students, uh, you know, uh, Ali Mashayek and, uh, and Yu Chen Ma and others who are really pushing the boundaries of these things. And, um, and I, I think that these observations can help us understand those processes better. So thank you very much.